Thank you very much, Vicky, and it's wonderful to be here today. Now, I'm going to pose the question, are we building great cities for women? And the answer to that is, sometimes, but we can do much better. Now, I'm going to talk about building great cities for women, but the men in the audience needn't switch off or turn on their iPhones. What works for women, just as well, works for everybody else. So it's really building great cities for everybody through the prism of how women use cities. Now, let's think and imagine how women use cities. Funnily enough, there hasn't been a lot of work done on the different ways they use cities. There was a really interesting study published about Vienna last year, which showed that it's what everybody would intuitively imagine to be the case. Women do a lot more darting and dashing around cities. So they tend to spend a bit more time moving around on short trips going to various different places as they run their lives, as they run their family lives, because uh, notwithstanding what we'd all like to, to think will be the case at some time in the future, women still do the preponderant household management, child childcare management stuff. I know Susan's going to talk about that a bit later. But women dart and dash around cities. So convenience and the minimum time spent in traffic and moving around is of enormous value to women as they lead busy work balance, work-life balance lives. So what do our cities look like in the developed world today? Well, not many of them look like this, but this is a graphic image of, of, the, of a suburban, of suburban environment in the United States. And I did this because this really shows the idea of suburbs, but suburbs on steroids. Now, most of us live in suburbs. I don't hate suburbs. I live in a suburb and I drive a car. This is not an anti-suburb, anti-car talk. It's a talk about how people seem to use the cities more today. And how they use the cities more today is that they value proximity, connectivity and urban type walkability more than they have in, since really since the late 19th century till the, and since the car was invented. Now, one example of this is, are these new apps. One, of, one example is WalkSchool, which is a terrific app, which is going to go live in a second, I'm hoping. Now, if you, if you punch... No, it's not going live. OK, so there you go. So you can punch in an address if you want to rent a house, and it will show you what the walkability of that address is. You can punch onto a location, which is happening, and up comes not only the rent and what the house looks like, but what its walkability score is. People value walkability more than they ever have. So another clear indication of how uh, popular and how much value is attached to proximity, walkability and urbanism these days is the differential value of housing as to whether it's near the centre of the city, say within 5Ks, or on the city's edge. The, the ratio of housing values as you get closer to the city centre has never been higher in proportion to the periphery than it is now. Now, there are forces at work which make living in the inner city really, really unaffordable for many people. What we need to do is to make sure that city centres are not unaffordable for all but the very affluent. We need to spread out urbanity and walkable urbanity. Now, this, this um, is an example. This is, this is a picture of Henry Ford's motor factory, or one of them anyway. He probably had multiple. But this is a, a fantastic image of industrial manufacture, industrial production. The idea between that product, uh, in, in, in industrial production of the 20th century, and of course, he made the motor car possible, cheap, accessible motor car, which made suburbs you know, possible to, to deliver is that industry would be located in one part of a city and housing would be located in the other part of a city and in the city centre would be where the banks and the law firms were and that the twain never met. There was a huge separation between work and life. And this, this um, idea of separation still drives a lot of our city planning today. But this idea of strict separation and isolation from work and home just doesn't work for the way we now lead our lives. There are incredible social and demographic forces at work which really change the way we want to use cities and the way we want to use cities isn't always reflected in the way they work. Now, one of these demographic forces, of course, is that women 
are much more participate much more in the workforce. About 40% of women work part time, which indicates to some extent that's the only work they're able to get, but to another extent it indicates that women are very busy working home and family. Um, so there are, the participation of women in the workforce is much higher than it was when Henry Ford was designing his, his factories and when the suburbs were being invented as a way of managing huge levels of population growth. The other important factor at work here is that we have an ageing population. Now, as people age, they don't need to work as they reach retirement or get beyond retirement, so it means they need to drive a car less. Now, women live longer... And, and as they age, they are more likely to enter retirement living on their own than men are. So you have a phenomenon where a lot of women are entering retirement as, you know, and, they, and they live entirely on their own. For these women, these women as they age, being able to lead, live a compact, walkable life is of enormous value to them if they want their lives to be enriched, as of course they all do as they get older, to be able to live an enriched and independent life. So creating places where you can have a compact, walkable and urban connected life is very, very important for people as they, as they age. We also have the phenomenon, and it's partly a function of the increasing participation in the of women in the workforce, that a lot of young families who typically in the 60s or the 70s would flee to the suburbs the minute a child was born are choosing to stay very close to the city centre, if not in the city centre. And the, the reason they're doing that is with, with very time poor, very stra stressed, you know, sort of time poor, hard working families are much more prepared to trade suburban, if you like, um, greenness or, um, you know, sort of sylv sylvan life in the suburbs for an urban, urban and more compact, convenient life near the city centre. Now, this is creating, if you like, a dual convergence of people who are wanting that walkable, urban, connected life where, public where access to walkability but access to public transit is a really essential part of ensuring that they have a high quality of life. So we have these urban forces in our midst at the same time as city centres as places for job, jobs and wealth creation have never been more important. Now, Ed Glazer's written uh, beautifully in his book of a couple of years ago called The Triumph of the City, which says that the, ever since the 1980s or the late 70s, with the growth of uh, knowledge-based industries, whether it be in information, innovation, technology, communications, banking, financial and professional services, has made the city centre more important to our economic well-being and created more jobs than has ever been the case before. So metro the city centres in metropolitan regions are more important than they have, a be have ever been. Now, the consequence of this is that poverty has become suburbanised. Just as it was urbanised in the late 19th century when people fled to the suburbs because they thought the city centre was dirty, smelly, with bad quality air, that situation has been completely reversed. People are coming back to the city centre to have easy access to the high-value high innovation, high knowledge intensive jobs uh, so that they can lead better lives or more, more fulfilled and convenient lives anyway. So we have a, a, a real issue with the suburbanisation of poverty. One of the most graphic examples of that that we saw last, last month, of course, was in Ferguson, Missouri, a, a suburb of St Louis, Missouri. Now there you had had over the previous 10 years an incredible intensification of social disadvantage, which was, of course, heavily, heavily mixed with uh, racial inequality. Now, Ferguson, Missouri has a very low-density suburban profile where the main, uh, you know, ar architectural features as you drive down the street, we're using Google, of course, I haven't been there, I have to confess that I haven't been there, but Google shows you so much these days, is, the, is these vast car parks convenience stores and fast food outlets. Now, what's interesting is that the knowledge workers, the dynamic creators of jobs, of businesses, no longer um, live in these areas. An example of a place where social disadvantage and poverty has been greatly ameliorated is, 
a, a place that used to be a byword for crime and social disadvantage and racial inequality really until the last 10 years, Harlem in New York City. Now, Harlem is one of the coolest parts of Manhattan now. What, how has that happened? Well, for a start, there was a very, very strong, clear um, political um, drive by the mayor of New York, Rudolph Giuliani, followed by others, to reduce crime. That really made Harlem come alive. And the reason that it was able to come alive so effectively is that it had the urban character and the urban bones to make urban renewal and revival easier. Once the crime was reduced and off the streets, people came back onto the streets and started the businesses, had the street life, opened the restaurants, opened the bars that has actually led to Harlem's revival. So what we need is a lot more Harlem's and a lot less Ferguson's. That is the way that we get to having both a fair and an equitable and a well-designed city for women and children and everyone else. So how do we get there? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to challenge the status quo. And that's always hard to do. People, particularly when they're thinking of their cities and their local communities, usually like things the way they are. But what needs to be clearly understood is that if things stay exactly the same as they are, even if it's on a few, if only a few blocks from you, if you multiply that thinking across a whole metropolitan area, we will not create more affordable urban walkability and connectivity that we need to drive future prosperity, future livability and future success. Now, you know, building a mandate for change isn't easy. It's, it's hardly ever easy. But if we don't build a mandate for change and understand that there almost needs to be a, a transformation in the way the middle ring of our cities works, say, for example, in the context of an Australian city from 5 to 20 to 25 kilometres from the city centre, if they don't have more pockets of urban density that support an urban lifestyle and support more jobs in knowledge-intensive industries, our city will become diminished and much less competitive than other cities in the world that do offer this urban walkability, this density and this connectivity. Now, public transport is, of course, essential for this. What else is essential? Really good, beautifully designed, density done well. Density done well means having great public spaces. What's and public spaces for people to come together as well as to go cycling and off into the countryside, if they, if they choose to, into the countryside inside the city. Because what is absolutely clear is that despite the advent of the internet, coming together face to face has never been more important. Now, um, uh, Professor Ito was talking in an earlier discussion about MIT, talking about how innovation is being decentralised, is going to the edge. Well, it is going to the edge in terms of the people who are doing the innovation, but the people on the edge have never wanted to be so close to the centres, to, to city centres, than they, than they have before. So city centres um, and poly centres within large metropolitan regions will be absolutely fundamental for the future success of our city regions. In the Sydney context, Parramatta is a great example of that, but much more has to happen besides. Now, in Australia, there is a challenge with nimbyism. Now, nimbyism is a manifestation of that, that idea that things mustn't change. But if things don't change, our, we will all be diminished. Women's pro lives prospects will be much less convenient, much less high quality, much less livable. We understand that change is essential. So challenge the status quo and challenge the assumptions that nimbyists actually take upon themselves to say change is not a good thing. We must build a mandate for change and we must make it happen, particularly the younger people in the audience. It is in your interest to make your city change, to make your city fit for the future. Thank you very much.